All right, good morning everyone. It is now 11 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started with this wonderful session at the 2020 TCC MakerCon. I'm Andrew Strohshine. I'll be monitoring the Q&A window and sharing your questions and comments. Um, please do feel free to speak up at any time, but since this is a live event, you won't be able to directly share your mic and camera with the group. So instead, use the Q&A window to type your questions and comments, and I'll pass them along to our speaker. Um, <clears throat> if you're having any difficulties with the technology, you can email Danelle Toops, and uh, she will help you with that. Um, we also do have ASL interpreting for all of our sessions this week, um, and that link is available back on the MakerCon schedule. Um, <clears throat> speaking of the schedule on that page, you also can sign up and register for the week-long Appathon. Um, don't worry if you missed yesterday's session. There's a session every day, and they'll teach you how to make an app, and there'll be a contest, and we'll be announcing winners at the end of the week uh, in the Friday session. Um, you can join that at any time, even if you missed yesterday's session. Today's session, we're really excited to share with you. We have Heather Rissler. Uh, Dr. Rissler is a biology instructor in Iowa, um, and she's going to talk to us today about the entrepreneurial mindset um, and how that relates to making. Uh, so let's just jump right in. Heather, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you today. I'm going to share my screen. And Andrew, can you just can you tell me if you can see my screen? I can. Awesome. OK, so I'm going to give you a little background information about how I came um, because I teach biology. And so I think sometimes people might wonder why am I talking about um, entrepreneurial mindset learning or why am I talking about maker spaces? And so I want to give you a little background um, of how I kind of came to enjoy uh, this, this world um, of the makerspace and the entrepreneurial mindset. So in about 2017, we had a camp that started on our campus in North Iowa. Um, the camp is supported by Verizon. It's the Verizon Innovative Learning Camp. And it is for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade girls. And they basically learn STEM. So they we have a maker space for them. We have 3D printers, 3D pens, vinyl cutters, uh, virtual reality headsets. They get tablets to do augmented reality with. And um, they, they're tasked with using all of the STEM tools that they learn about. Um, they're tasked with coming up with a solution to a problem in their community. And these relate to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so the campers, these young women, they learn about this process of design thinking. And when I first got trained to lead this camp, I saw this picture of the design thinking and the steps. And I thought to myself, this is really what scientists do. I mean, we empathize, we're trying to understand a problem, we define it, we ideate, we come up with ideas, we prototype, we test out our hypotheses, and then we come back and, and loop back into this process when, whenever it's needed. And so I felt very comfortable. I thought maybe I do actually understand entrepreneurship better than I thought I did because this is really how science works. The other thing that was very impressive to me is when we gave these young women these tools to use and they were able to to basically work within a maker space, they came up with amazing ideas and product prototypes. And so just two examples, um, this particular product was a device that if you pull this little piece off of it, it would send an alert that you were in danger. And so they started with kind of a Play-Doh prototype and they iterated and they eventually used electronics and 3D printing to build their prototype. This um, group, we have a, we're in Iowa, so there are many, many cows and many, many pigs and many young people who show their animals at the fair. And this uh, group of young ladies, they were concerned about people not using proper um, hygiene when uh, viewing animals at the fair. And so they designed a prototype of a watch that would allow them to basically monitor their animals while they were being shown and to, um, 
to alert people if they were not following the proper hygiene protocols. And so watching these young women uh, who basically just took these ideas and ran with them and really came up with things that related to their interest made me a believer in the design thinking process. It made me a believer in entrepreneurial mindset thinking, and it made me a believer in maker spaces and allowing students this opportunity to drive their own education and to, and to pick projects that are interesting to them. So when I think of maker spaces, I mean, physically, I think of the, the type of space that we have where we've got all of these tools that the students can access and they can use this in their um, process of coming up with their project. I also think of the laboratories that I teach in, that I do my science labs in as a maker space. And then I also think of um, the brainstorming, you know, maker space in terms of the, the mental processes that we go through when we're trying to come up with solutions to uh, solving complex problems. So this is a, a diagram that I use with my students in my science classes. And again, I just I'm using this to illustrate that that really the design thinking process that's so critical for entrepreneurs and that's so critical for maker spaces really is is very much in alignment with the process of science and scientific investigations. And so we're thinking about empathizing. We're looking at problems in our society. We are coming up with uh, tests that we can do, we're prototyping, we're iterative, we're redoing things and, and gaining information and coming back and applying that as needed. And it's not linear. And so a lot of times when people learn about the scientific method, we learn about it in this linear fashion. And this diagram would indicate that it really isn't linear. Um, just like with design thinking, you might be in the middle of testing something and you might learn about a new problem. And so you might go back you know, to step one or two. And um, I could be uh, interpreting data from an experiment and I could have a new observation that leads me back to developing a new hypothesis. So they're both um, iterative processes. They have that in common. The other thing that, that kind of came to me um, when I was thinking about uh, teaching and learning and how maker spaces and the entrepreneurial mindset can be so important for this process. I was at a biology conference and we were talking about best practices or high impact educational practices in teaching biology. And in the sciences and STEM, we often refer to this as uh, three-dimensional learning. So we take core concepts in biology or, or whatever STEM discipline we're teaching, we think about how that integrates with the practice of science and then how we can apply that to global ideas. So basically it's problem solving and kind of the note that I highlighted when I was doing this brainstorming process, which to me uh, felt like a maker space on a big piece of uh, post-it note paper, um, is that I kind of made this connection that really when we're talking about these high impact educational practices and we're talking about multidimensional learning, it's really the same um, tone as entrepreneurial mindset learning. And so I feel like many different disciplines are we're trying to accomplish the same thing and that maybe we need to kind of combine our efforts and work together. So what I would like the participants to do, and you can you can put this in the Q&A if you'd like or, or just think about it, um, but I want you to think back to when you were in college and I want you to think about a, uh, a learning experience that you had that um, has stuck with you today. Um, so something that you can still remember doing that was very impactful for you. And so if you can just think about that, if you wanna put it in the Q&A, you can. Um, but I would, when I've asked people to do this before, I have found that most people pick something that falls into one of these um, high impact educational practices. And so I'll give you my example. My example, even though I'm a scientist, it was actually from a class on um, politics and the creative arts. And we were able to pick a project that we wanted to work on. And I wrote a paper um, comparing the uh, play Angels in America um, about the HIV crisis 
to the play uh, The Crucible by Arthur Miller. And I mean, again, that's not my discipline. I'm a scientist. I love science. Um, but the fact that I got to choose the project and I got to choose how I presented the information and I had ownership of that uh, was something that was very impactful for me. And so I think that if you look at all of these high impact practices, whether it's problem based learning, um, case study based learning, et cetera, that what they have in common is really the students are driving their learning process. And that is what um, entrepreneurial mindset teaching and learning allows us to do with students. It's also what makerspaces allow students to do. Participants in makerspaces are driving their own questions that they want to answer. And so all of these different types of high impact educational practices have that in common. So I hope everybody had a chance to think about maybe an impactful learning experience they had when they were in college. One and of the ones we have, yes. Heather, is uh, mentioning walking around New Orleans and seeing all of the places where the famous writers wrote. It was impactful to experience the environment that inspired all the famous novels. I don't think anybody can see me, but my mouth was like hanging open. I was like, oh, I, that is so cool. Like as a young, I mean, as a student, I would have loved to do that. And that's the kind of stuff I think that gets you excited about learning. I think that's a great example. I really like that. So I'm going to give you a couple of uh, examples. Uh, oh, sorry. I've, I've, ex I've actually got uh, one uh, in a physics class that I took. Um, we, uh, the, the teacher worked with the local police department. Uh, and so when we were doing basic, uh, kinematics, you know, motion, um, the, the project was, um, we had a police car drive down the street and we guessed the speed. We had another officer using a, a radar gun to actually detect the actual speed. Then the police car slammed on the brakes, uh, which caused a skid mark. And then we had to um, measure the skid mark and then use physics equations to calculate the speed the car was going at the time it applied the brakes based on friction between rubber and concrete and so on. Uh, and so that was something where we were all directly out doing the measuring, doing the thinking, uh, and using our gut instinct of, well, that car looks like it's going about 35 to 40 miles per hour, and then doing an experiential learning process where we were finding out was our guess accurate or not. That's a great example, and I'm going to bet that you probably don't remember the times that that instructor lectured to you for an hour. Very it's, infrequently, yes. Yeah. There was a lot of a lot of good hands-on seeing it actually in practice. We I'm sure we did lots of lecture, but I really don't remember staring at the professor for hours and hours. I remember the actual experiential learning. Exactly. And that's kind of the point I think that I was hoping to make is that, I mean, I'm 46 years old. I, and I, I wrote that paper that I was talking about. I was 19. I mean, so much time has passed and yet I still remember that. And you still remember this experiential learning um, opportunity that you had in your physics course. And so those are the kind of things that really stick with us. And so I think that's why they're so powerful. So I'll give you an example of how um, my transformation and my teaching and, and learning uh, was really when I when I had the opportunity to work with these young girls in this camp and I became more um, educated about makerspaces and entrepreneurial mindset teaching and learning. I realized I really need to be doing this in my STEM classes. This is not something that you should just do in an engineering class or that you should just do in a business class. I thought I, I need to give my students these authentic um, experiences. And so the class that I chose to start with was it's a biotechnology class and it is taken by our agricultural students. And it was a class that was given to me um, because it had not been going very well. And so I took this class over and there were challenges. And one of the things that I realized very quickly, these young students, um, they they want to work on a farm. They're, they're hands on. They don't uh, want to learn something just for the sake of learning it. They, they want to understand how does it apply to their world. 
And so I basically transformed the entire class into an entrepreneurial mindset learning curriculum. And so an example of how I did this, um, we traditionally would do a fermentation lab. Fermentation is actually one of the oldest forms of biotechnology. And so it's a very traditional lab you would do in a biotech course. And so typically they would just do the lab for the sake of doing the lab. You know, you'd mix your different things together and see um, how the fermentation process proceeded. And so I transformed this lab and converted it by asking the students to um, create a seasonal beer. And so in this sense, again, it's a maker space is taking place in this laboratory setting. And so they had to um, use and choose different spices that they wanted to use to create a seasonal beer. They had to study how those spices affected the growth of microbes. And then they had to set up their fermentation reactions with the various spices to see um, how it affected the production of carbon dioxide and ethanol. And so basically they were, they were still doing the same kind of lab, but with a more practical purpose in mind. The other thing that the students did was they brainstormed questions to ask of our one of our local breweries. So we're a pretty small town, we've got about 30,000 people, um, but we do have two uh, local breweries that are um, locally owned. And so the students came up with questions, including things like, well, what's the hardest beer to make? What's the most expensive beer to make? And um, we emailed those questions to the business owner and the business owner was very gracious and got back to us with very detailed answers. And the students learned um, some surprising things. One of the things that really uh, surprised them was that one of the most popular beers was a basil beer. And they thought that sounded really, really weird. Um, and they were getting this basil from a local grower. So it was kind of interesting just to see how different entrepreneurs in the community interact with one another um, to produce their products. And so uh, the students, um, their kind of final assignment or assessment was to write a letter to the business owner kind of stating their case for their seasonal beer with their data. Um, so I think that that experience uh, was is much more meaningful for the students than just the traditional um, fermentation lab that we would typically do. My other interest is I am co-director of our Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at NIAC. And I, I really, like, really believe um, in this entrepreneurial mindset learning and using the makerspace uh, idea across the curriculum. I do not think it should just live in engineering classes and business classes. I've seen um, how this works in my science classes and I want to basically infiltrate the entire curriculum across campus. The problem I run into is that not everyone is on board with this idea of doing something different and new. Um, and a book that I read a couple of years ago that really helped me uh, is written by James Lang. And it's called Small Teaching. And he makes this argument, um, he, and he likens the small teaching to what he call or what people call small baseball. And in baseball, if you look at the teams that win, it's not always the teams that have the best hitters or that hit the most home runs or that throw the most no um, hit games. He, um, this idea of small ball or small baseball is that sometimes it's just stealing the bases. Um, it's getting that double play. It's the little things that add up over time. And so his suggestion to educators is just to make one change at a time. You don't have to always swing for the fences. Just take one assignment that you're doing, um, one assessment that you're doing, and just tweak it and see if you can make it more experiential. See if you can tie in some um, problem-based learning and things like that. And then over time, eventually your curriculum will change as a whole. And so that is kind of where I'm at in my journey is trying to really um, get others on board with this approach to teaching, um, get others. Uh, we do we do sometimes still tend to in the, in the sciences rely on lectures and traditional uh, teaching methodologies. And I just feel like when we have these young people that are experiencing uh, these maker spaces at a young age, 
And then we bring them to college and we say, well, you just have to sit down and um, we use what, what, what you might call a pedagogy of compliance. Do what I say, check off this box and you'll be okay. Um, I just don't think that we're doing them any favors. And so I feel like we really, we really do need to infiltrate the curriculum with this uh, approach to teaching that allows students to drive their own learning in an experiential way. And if we think about solving problems in the 21st century, people who have been educated using a pedagogy of compliance are not going to be set up to solve those problems. And so we're not doing students any favor if we don't get on board um, with this process. And so that's kind of the other thing I guess I just wanna um, leave you with is depending on what your position is at your institution, uh, I hope this is something that we can discuss with our colleagues across disciplines and that we can get students engaged in these authentic activities across the curriculum. Thank you. So actually, I, I really like that last ex, uh, example that you gave um, because uh, of all of the sciences that I took, uh, and I took at least one semester of each in college, chemistry was my least favorite. And the reason is because uh, the lab was um, so procedural. It, it was exactly what you said. We sat in the lab. Uh, we had step one, pour this into this. Step two, take the beaker with this and pour it into that. Step three, do this. And then at the end, there was always the question was, uh, measure the precipitate and what color was it? And, you know, I remember at one point thinking, I feel like I'm in kindergarten. They're asking me to say, hey, okay, now how big is this and what color is it? Does anyone know the word for this color? Like, why am I in college? And, and the, the outcome of this exercise is for me to identify a color. Um, I, you know, I, I paid how many tuition hours for this? Um, so to take something like that and, and transform it the way you did, I think is really powerful. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's, it's interesting too because physics education actually has been one of the leaders in problem-based learning. And so I'm not surprised that in your physics class you had that experience that you did. Um, and I think some of the other sciences we've kind of lagged behind. And I, I call those labs that you're talking about the cookie cutter labs where, I mean, it's like everybody knows what's gonna happen. Like that's not really exciting. Like how are you gonna get people excited about going into STEM and solving problems if you're having them do something where you already know the outcome? Do you have, um, since the, the focus was on uh, connecting to uh, local businesses, for example, the brewery. Um, <clears throat> what? How did you make those connections? Was it? Was it? Did the idea come to you? Did you sit down with you know the modern equivalent of a phone book and just Google businesses or scan for anything that might be related to your labs? How how did that happen? Well, luckily we have um, at NIAC we have uh, the John Papa John's Entrepreneurial Center. And I work very closely um, with that group because of the, the work I've done with the Verizon camp and because of its focus on social entrepreneurship. And so I think because I made that connection with them, that really helped me tap into local businesses. Um, and I just, it's the, it really surprises me. I guess I'm just, I feel really lucky and blessed, I guess, because I, I, you know, I am a scientist. I am a science teacher. You know, I could have just stayed on that path, but by making that connection, I feel like it opened up my world to this, to all kinds of ideas that I had never thought about before. And it has done nothing but help me help my students. And so I think that that, the idea, the concept of a makerspace and, and, um, being willing to make connections outside of your discipline and outside of your field um, to just lead you to places that you didn't think you could go. And so if you had asked me like six, you know, 10 years ago, would to be honest with you, and they joke about this with me at um at my at my college, when I first took the camp on and, and they said you're gonna be doing this STEM camp with entrepreneurship, I said, uh, I don't know about that because didn't please forgive me. I don't want to offend anybody here. But I said, 
when I think of entrepreneurs, I think of like Donald Trump and I think of people making money and I don't think of like people helping people. (laughs) And so I had this completely different notion of what it meant to be an entrepreneur. And when I really learned about it, I realized these are the people in our community that are making our community run. And, um, and they, yeah, so I just, it really shifted my entire thinking. What are some ideas you have for the future? Do you have any new um, thing, especially I guess right now, how, how has that changed now since experiential learning is suddenly very difficult and complicated this year uh, and looks like it probably will continue to be so for another year or maybe more? That's a really good point. I mean, for us, the lab-based teaching is problematic because of the, um, we're in a hybrid mode. Um, and so that that does make it, more challenging. Luckily, there are a lot of uh, resources online, simulations and things like that. So there are some ways I can kind of get around it. So we might be doing more makerspace activities on paper, so to speak, you know, as opposed to like physically getting in there and actually doing them in the lab. Um, But that's a really good point, though, that if this we are shifting and I I am going to have to think about how to best do that in a in a hybrid situation. Uh, I'm curious. I I know that uh, in your, your bio that we have for you, it says you're working on your uh, your doctorate. Uh, is that have you found any ways to tie that into your doctorate? Is that a similar focus of study, or have you moved on to something different? Well, yeah, my my doc my ed my ed D that I'm working on. I um, it still relates to STEM education, but I I really have a passion for um, reducing opportunity gaps, and we have. Um, we're in North Iowa. It's a, Iowa is already very white. Um, North Iowa is more white than Iowa. And we have um, a population of students of color uh, who are not, you know, are not doing as well um, as our other students. And so that is something I'm really focused on is how can we um, provide a support network uh, for our students of color in a predominantly white area at a predominantly white rural institution, um, particularly in the STEM, um, because STEM has had opportunity gaps. Um, we've been talking about this for decades and we've been talking about it and it's not getting any better. Um, but I do think that my my um, new knowledge of this entrepreneurial mindset, I feel like it makes me more open to how I can think about solving problems. So in a way, I, I do still think it ties into my my doctoral work that I'm doing now. What do you know in your area? What what are the maker spaces that are available there? Uh, g- give us you know, what's what do you know that's in at your educational institution or other educational institutions nearby? Um, what's available publicly, maybe through a, a library or a community organization? And then what might be do you know of any private maker groups that have their own space? Like we we've got one in Dallas, uh, the Dallas Maker Space, which is. Uh, a very broad variety of making. It, they have yeah. an electronics lab, they've got art, they have uh, actual uh, uh, vehicle bays where you can pull your car in and do uh, work there. I know a guy who rebuilds and fixes pinball machines in the makerspace there. They have a green screen room and all that kind of stuff. What what kinds of spaces do you have in your area? Not that fancy, um, <laughs> we're very tiny, but um, again, I think we were really lucky to partner with the, um, it was the National Association of Community College Entrepreneurship, NACI, um, that also uh, supports this uh, Verizon Innovative Learning Camp. And so we were able to procure um, all kinds of equipment. So we have the 3D printers, we have the VR goggles, we have the iPad cart, um, the 3D pens, the vinyl cutter, we have all that stuff. And for the most part, for about five years, I was the only person using it. And so it's like, we really need to get this used more. We we luckily had a young man come in to work with our Papa John Entrepreneurial Center who had um, experience running a maker space in Montana. And he has now taken a position and he is basically taking that equipment and cre- t- took a space on campus that was available, a room, and is creating that now into a maker space. And he is collaborating with our K through 12 um, system as well, so that other students can come in and um, use that space. 
He has run several workshops uh, with faculty or anybody who wanted to participate, and they actually had a product that came out. I'm not going to be able to explain it because it has something to do with corn, and I'm from Arkansas, so I'm not like I'm not like a corn person, but it has something to do with how you plant the corn. And it was actually one of our um, our business faculty that designed this product during their makerspace. It was basically a makerspace camp for grownups. And um, he designed this product and it's, uh, it's actually going somewhere. I mean, it's it's been really exciting. So they, they're in the process of doing it. They're just in the process of setting up that physical space using the equipment that we were so lucky to have on hand. Because honestly, otherwise, we couldn't afford it, and especially right now. Right. Yeah. What um, can you give us? We have a, a question from someone in the audience. Um, they'd like more information on uh, maker spaces and making on paper. And I think uh, maybe they were referring to your your comments about how difficult it is to do that in the lab now, trying to do some of those things on paper. Can you talk more about that? Yes, I mean, the, I think the idea is that, yeah, it's very challenging. I think the the example I can give, I have another um, science related activity where the students, um, we look at personal um, genomics or pharmacogenomics. So we look at how you can use a person's genetic information to make predictions about what types of medications they will respond best to. And it's a case study. Um, and so normally we would do a lab where they would actually test their own genotype. We may not be able to do that depending on where our school is in the um, hybrid versus online. So, but one of the things that, that I can do to kind of bring in that um, social issue, social justice issues or global issues is we, we talk about the case study and we talk about well, who has access to that testing. Um, it's not required that hospitals do the genetic test. And so this is for a drug that is used in chemothera as a chemotherapeutic agent. People can respond very poorly to it if they don't have the right enzymes to process it. It's a relatively simple, relatively inexpensive test to do to figure out how they're going to respond to the drug but it is not required. Insurance does not have to cover it. It depends on what hospital you go to. And so then we kind of talk about that as a social justice issue of who has access to that healthcare. Why doesn't everyone have access to that? What can we do to kind of solve that problem? So I guess in that sense, to me, that's like a, a maker space with pen and paper that they're brainstorming and trying to figure out why is why does this problem exist? And then what can we do to help solve this problem? And so that I guess that's kind of where I'm going with that is that I might have to do more more of those types of activities to accommodate right. this weird um, place that we're in right now. Yeah, very interesting. Um, we have a comment from someone saying, uh, as someone who grew up in a rural community, 4-H is learning to do by doing uh, things as Fancy, like I, I think they're referring to the maker space that I referred to here in Dallas, things that fancy don't exist or are geographically far away. Um, and this person commented that they like that you are holding camps for these things. I do too. I I have been so inspired by watching these young women. I just, I, it, it, and it makes, the thing that makes me sad as a college educator is I watch what they're able to do. And then I look at my students that I get at the college level and I feel like at some point along the way we broke them and that we took that away from them. You know, that that Nat, like those those young ladies that came up with that little watch because they were so concerned that people were like touching the cows and then not washing their hands, you know, and so they they were able to like they're so creative, you know, and they're they're so natural at problem solving. And then we get to college and that's just not how we run things really and so yeah i'm very passionate about it i had a, a similar experience uh thinking about that i i was a math major uh, i was a psychology major first and then a math major so you know analyzing things is just it's in my blood um but i i remember uh now every time i hear people which is 95 percent of people hate math they they hate it mm. they hate it. by the time they get to seventh or eighth grade everybody hates math and you know, as someone who was a math major, the the unfortunate thing is math is is a top heavy discipline. The advanced math is actually the fun part. The, mm. the fun math is actually calculus because it's powerful. That's the first time you're you're learning something that you can actually see at work in the day to day world. Mm. And never 
even as a math major, I can tell you the reality is nobody will ever need to know negative b plus or minus the square root of blah 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 over 2ac you know that there's just you're never going to need the quadratic formula that's that's a we have calculators that do that for us um and so it like you said seeing that difference between if we could find a way to engage kids in mathematics in a way that is functional operational experiential to where they don't have that built in i hate this because it's boring Mm -hmm. And then by the time then when we're trying to teach them really important math that could open up career opportunities for them or opportunities to make discoveries to benefit all of humanity, they're just so turned off mm -hmm. to it. They're, it's a, it's a non-starter. It's it's dead uh, by the time they even get to high school. So I actually I wanted to branch from that to what you just said about the differences between <clears throat> your your camp students and your college students because I was going to ask. What percentage of your students come in maker ready? You know, do you have those students who come in and you have to actually transition them away from methodical procedural because that's all they've ever known and they maybe are resistant to having to do what seems like a lot of work to, OK, I got to go to a brewery and talk to them and then <laughs> assimilate all this information and then do it, oh, do it myself. Can you just give me instructions and let me do it? What do you see that at work of where you you have to actually help the students move into a maker mindset or do they come in with that already? I think yeah, that's that's a great question. And I would say our career technical students come in maker ready. I feel like they again are naturally inclined to want to touch things, build things, tear them apart, see how they work. Um, I would say some of my more traditional like STEM students that are maybe headed more towards like pre-med or pre-nursing, et cetera, um, maybe are, don't want things to be as messy. And that's what I usually call it when we're doing things like this. I try to remind them this is going to be messy and that's OK. Messy is OK. Um, so you're right. I think you have to. Um, the thing that I do is I start them off from day one. So like in my biotech class, the very first day we do a um, entrepreneurial activity where I have them go around campus and make observations and come up with a pain point that they identify, interview people, talk to them, and then they brainstorm a solution. So from day one, I have them thinking like that. And so I, I always find that if I have my students start on day one doing whatever it is I want them to do for the semester, they're more likely to buy into it then if we're like 10 weeks in and I'm like, oh, by the way, we're going to start thinking like an entrepreneur. Um, and so I that's kind of my approach has just been frame the whole class that way. You know, I, I have I have colleagues that say, well, my students will never ask questions. They'll never talk. Well, do you have them talking on day one? Like you you got to start that like right away. Um, you set the tone. And so I, I, I feel like that's what helps me do that. Um, I think you also need to remind students that you're there to support them through the messiness and that it's OK to fail. And I think that's the beauty of design thinking. That's the beauty of the scientific process is failing is a part of it. Um, so I think if you're there to support them in that process and they know that you've got their back, um, I think they they can make that transition. How does that affect um, the structure of the class? You know, the, the thing in education tends to to go in, you know, five to ten year trend patterns. And uh, the, the thing certainly in the last decade has been flipping the classroom to where mm -hmm. Students are doing the learning kind of they're they're getting the content on their own and then they're getting hands on expert tutoring, walking through questions in class. How does this experiential learning change the structure of the class? Where did now for you, where does the content delivery occur? Is that kind of interstitially part of the process or is there still some kind of chunk where and you also need to set aside 45 minutes to review this chapter or watch this video? Yeah, I, and I do use the flipped approach. So my students watch their um, content videos um, at home and then we use our classroom time for uh, high impact educational um, practices. 
Uh, the other, so I, so I do think it ties in nicely with that flipped approach. The other thing that it ties in nicely with is universal design for learning, um, which is meeting students where they're at and giving them ownership, giving them multiple ways of accessing material, multiple ways of measuring their learning. And I feel like this approach uh, of uh, experiential learning is, is very much in line with UDL. And I think more people are starting to learn about UDL. Um, and I think that's going to be hopefully the next trend over the next five to 10 years um, that, that we move away from the pedagogy of compliance because that uh, that makes me sad. That, that's really interesting. You you actually made me think of something. I'm a, I'm a huge board gamer um, mm. and uh, I, I immediately related what you said about uh, having a universal design where there's multiple things going on instead of this kind of top-down didactic mm -hmm. approach. It, one one thing in, in a game, the question in every game at some point is, what what's the victory condition? How do I get victory points? How do I how do you win? Is it the first person past a certain point? Is it a collection of a certain number of points? Is it who has all the gold or who? Uh, has the best factories or you know whatever game you're playing and one of the things that I've seen is the most enjoyable games the games that you want to come back to replay over and over at, at the more complicated level are games that have multiple paths to victory mm -hmm. so if you've got four players instead of it basically being hungry hungry hippos where every single person is just trying give me the marbles give me the marbles i want the marbles give me the marbles give me the marbles and that's it's that's it mm. so so there's only really one winner because only one person can have the most marbles the fun games are the ones where some people might specialize in let's say it's an economic game some people might specialize in uh turning their money into victory points some people might specialize in the number of electrical power plants they build some people might mm. specialize in the connections they make between their power plants and so there's multiple paths to victory and it allows each player to choose a path that kind of fits their personality and so I was thinking about how we don't really have that in traditional education. And I, I wonder how many students sit in class and think, well, that smart kid over there is really good at math. And so they're always going to learn it faster. And I'm they're comparing themselves and they're thinking, yeah. well, I'm never as good as that kid. I'm never as good as that kid at art. I'm never good, as good at that kid as understanding history or understanding Shakespeare. And so I can't win at this class. I yeah. can't meet the success condition because those students over there are going to meet the success condition and I'm going to feel like an idiot. So I will just disengage and be quiet and not participate, not try. And, and that's the part that breaks my heart. Like I, I just feel like that's unacceptable, you know, that we we have to do better. Um, so I I do feel like the both the makerspace concept and the entrepreneurial mindset teaching and learning um, could be the things that help get us to that point where where those situations are no longer happening. Yeah, I relate that back to your your brewery example, where if we think of that as as a gamified process, mm -hmm. um, there there isn't necessarily any one best beer. It might mm -hmm. be. What's the crowd favorite? When we all sample the resulting beer, what's the crowd favorite? Uh, another way of saying what the quote unquote best beer is, is well, which one has the lowest production costs? Mm -hmm. Another one might be which one has the lowest environmental, environmental impact in terms of energy consumption or harvesting, uh, how much grain do you have to harvest to produce this? What's the, the structural material? Uh, another might be um, designing the beer or uh, creativity or, um, you know, there's just different ways of succeeding. Um, and as an entrepreneur, I, I guess that's you always have to be flexible and looking because the market human nature is very kind of fickle and changeable. Mm -hmm. And you have to be willing to say, I can't just stick to this one thing. Otherwise, I'm going to end up like Kodak and Blockbuster, where here's this one thing I'm really, <laughs> really good at. I'm really good yeah. at renting VHS tapes. I'm so good at that. And it's a multi-million dollar industry and it'll always be that way. But it isn't. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, and sorry to interrupt, but I, I think that that's the other benefit of this is that students entering the workforce. I mean, I, I heard this somewhere that we, so young people like in K through 12, we don't even know the jobs that they'll be entering when right. they go into the workforce. Like we don't, we, we can't even see, conceive of what those are yet. 
And so this way of teaching and learning is going to prepare them for that uncertainty. Um, yeah, we have an obligation, I think, to do that. Uh, tell us more about what got you started down this track. Were you at a at a conference and you heard a, a, an inspiring seminar? Were you just talking to your colleagues and kind of realized we we're all sharing the same frustrations and getting our students motivated? Did you yourself go through some kind of uh, proto makerspace uh, experience that you thought, I want to share this with other people? How did you get started? Well, I, I really think it was the camp. It was the working with NACI and the Verizon Innovative Learning Camp um, that caused me to step outside of my comfort zone because I, again, I had very kind of biased views about what entrepreneurship was. And it was watching these, these young ladies um, basically just do amazing things uh, with with trying to solve problems in their community and seeing their energy and then thinking why why am I not seeing that in my college classroom? What can I do to to change that? Because it's, it's my responsibility. Um, it's not going the student. It's not the student's job to change that. Um, and so I realized I needed to incorporate some of these things that I was learning about in in directing and teaching in this camp. That I needed to, to basically incorporate that into the college classroom. And then once I started seeing the benefit of that, I thought I need everybody else to start doing this. <laughs> so, um, so it kind of just went from there. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a comment from someone saying we need to stop asking young people what they want to be when they grow up and instead ask them what problems they want to solve. And that, that's something that came up in yesterday's session, uh, which was really good. Uh, and I, I like that there's a tie in to all of our sessions with this. Yeah. There's I think there's if you were to ask um, a bunch of 15 year olds who here wants to be a chemist when they grow up, I, I don't think many hands would go up uh, unless their parents let them watch Breaking Bad and then that's the wrong kind of chemist. Exactly. Uh, you know, uh, but if you ask them, hey, who would like to find a, a, a better brownie? You know, I want to make a, a tastier brownie. Who would like to come up with uh, water that doesn't have to be chlorinated the same way or fluoridated the same way or whatever. Um, you you get a lot more interesting participation. You, you'd be able to draw people into the STEM fields into to making more if that's how we presented it to them instead of who wants to be a chemist because they don't they don't really know what that means at that point. I agree. Do you um, do you have any follow up from from students? Have you been doing this long enough either through students or the camps? Have you seen camp kids come into your classes? Do you do you have students that you maybe have kept in contact with or they come back to you a few years later and you see where they took this experience, this experiential learning and the entrepreneurial mindset? Yes, and so I, I finally had, I'm feeling old because I finally had my first camper in my college class. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, so yes, I, I and I, and I was really impressed uh, by what she was able to do. Uh, we had some campers that actually started a business during the um, the COVID-19 crisis. You know, they uh, started a, a business. So so they do seem to be taking it with them. They, um, I, I feel like it is transformative for them. And I'm doing surveys and collecting data as I'm teaching too, so I can try to make more sense out of how this is impacting students. We have a question from Cliff. Um, I wonder if you might give us some ideas of how we can foster an entrepreneurial spirit or mindset in students in the near term using at hand materials such as paper, web, whiteboard, projects involving looking things up on the web like Alibaba, Amazon, etc. Yeah, so the um, one of the other groups that I worked with, um, the Keen Foundation, they, they really focus on engineering education and applying entrepreneurial mindset to that. And they kind of break it down into what they call the three C's, uh, curiosity, creating value, and making connections. And so I think you can take really any classroom activity that you're doing and you can transform it into an entrepreneurial um, learning opportunity by letting the students be curious, by asking them to make connections um, to their world, to things they're learning about in other classes, and thinking about how they can create value so how might we improve this process? Um, so I, I think it, it sometimes just involves a little a little tweak, um, just like like the fermentation example. 
we always do a fermentation lab. That is what you do in a biotechnology class. But now if I can say, okay, well, how can we create a seasonal beer and let's involve a local business owner? I think that 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 one shift made that happen. Do um, since this person asked about um, web projects or, or websites, do you have any um, uh, organizations that you're connected to or involved in? Do you have any books or websites that have been really helpful to you where you get ideas or make connections with other people? Well, I mean, the Na I really like the NACI website. I think the um, Community College Entrepreneurship Association is very helpful. Um, I like the Keating, the Keen Foundation. I think just also just talking to people. I think even doing things like this, like uh, um, it's just fun to hear about what other people are doing on their campuses and how they're handling um, these issues. Do we have any more questions from the audience? I, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all today. Um, it's something I, I get very excited about, so. <laughs> Is the, the program that you do, is it, um, you have a biotech class, you're, you're a biology professor. Are most of your students bi bioscience majors pre-med or do you get students who just get filled a slot in their schedule and, and then from there you kind of get to evangelize them? Yeah, I mean the biotech class uh, is really the pre-ag students. So they really specifically want, want to get back to the farm. Um, but I am incorporating this into my other biology classes as well. And so it's, it's something that all of my students will be um, exposed to. That's, that's kind of my goal. All right, well. We don't have any more questions from the audience. Let's see. Um, we oh, we do have a, a thank you from Cliff saying those are good ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff, for asking. Well, thank you all for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We um, we will be doing uh, more sessions this week. Uh, we've got one tomorrow. The session tomorrow is a conversation about badging in all of its forms and for all age, ages. So uh, creating new pathways towards job credentialing instead of here's the degree or here's the certification, but there are badges um, that you obtain along the way. So it's going to be an interesting conversation. Um, we do have our social networking activity this afternoon at two o'clock. I hope everyone will join us for that. We'll be doing make along projects um, that you can do with generally with stuff that you've got around the house. Um, we do again, we have we've got the Appathon going on, so I encourage people to go to the uh, website and sign up for that. Um, but thank you very much, Dr. Rissler, for being with us. And uh, we, we learned a lot of great stuff today. And uh, thank you. Thank you all. Have a lovely day.